Hello and welcome to the first of a 12-month series of Emergency Care Improvement Programme webinars covering a range of topics to support urgent and emergency care across the health and social care system. Although designed and aimed at the 28 ESIP systems, content will be useful for all colleagues working within urgent and emergency care, so please feel free to share details of this series with colleagues. The first webinar, Getting Off to a Flying Start, is presented by Cathy Wild and Gavin Ayres of the ESIP Central PMO team. Thank you. So welcome to today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is titled Getting Off to a Flying Start and it's going to look at two areas. Firstly, managing the project and secondly, what makes a really good PMO. Um, we're aware that many people involved in the programme have varying levels of experience and skills when it comes to project management and also setting up and running a PMO. Um, so, with that in mind, today's session has got three key objectives. Firstly, we want to try and create a shared understanding of the basics of project management and PMO approaches, and that's aiming to try and get everybody on the same page from the start. In doing that, we want to share common language, structures and processes, and then we'll go on later to talk about what really makes a great PMO. So, I suppose the best place to start would be to look at what a project actually is. Well, if we look at the common definition, it's just a structured process for achieving some predetermined aim, and we do that by using a set of coordinated activities, and we follow a project life cycle. And that would usually have a specified start and end date. It's temporary in nature, would normally use a team approach, and there would generally be limited resources. Now, that's all a bit wordy, so if we break that down into some key characteristics, um, what actually is a project? Well, a project always includes a start and end time. Um, it isn't business as usual. It isn't something that's going to go on forever. Um, a project creates something new or fixes and improves something that already exists. So it may well be a new product or a new service or, or improving a, a product or service. A project proposes and supports change and it does that by introducing change in a um, logical way. Uh, projects can be performed by either individuals or by teams, and it's often better to have a team approach because then you have um, a wider range of skills um, at hand. Projects are often constrained by resources, and that could be um, cost, it could be time, or it could be people. And projects should always be planned, executed, and controlled as a cycle, and it's this cycle that should be underpinned by a good program management office, or as we call it, a PMO. So if we look towards the image on the right hand of the slide, um, here's our project cycle. So we can see in red at the top, we start off with a project initiation, and it's at that time that we're looking at defining what exactly the project is, and what it's going to deliver, and when. We then look at project planning, which is the yellow section, where we look at the more detailed planning of how we're going to get to that end point in terms of what we want to deliver. Going around to the blue section, project execution, this is where we actually do the work that's needed. And during the doing phase, um, we'll always monitor um, and, and check on progress and, and control to make sure we don't go out of scope. And finally, project closure, the green section, where we'll always want to review just to check that we have actually delivered what we intended to at the start and to see if we've learned any lessons that we could share across other areas of work. So in terms of today's session and project management, um, there are nine key areas which we're going to cover today. And it's really important to remember that each of these areas is underpinned and supported by PMO involvement. Now, as we talk through these at each stage, we're going to try to show you examples of how we've done this within the Emergency Care Improvement Programme. So we're going to start off looking at aims, so what are the aims and objectives of a project. We'll then move into scope, so what's in and out of scope and what are the desired outcomes. We'll look at stakeholders, so who they are and how we engage with them. We'll look at structure. Um, which is the project structure, um, the team structure, governance and documentation. 
we'll look at the time frame for a project and how that then leads into the planning of how we make sure that we deliver and how we monitor progress. We'll look at risks and issues and how we identify, uh, manage and mitigate them. We'll go on to talk about reporting our progress and also sharing, our, sharing and recording our learning. And once we've considered those areas, we'll look at what makes a great PMO. So if we can first of all look at aims. Um, so all projects need to need to have a, a clear and concise aim or goal. So to relate this to our project here at the ECIP program, um, we've uh, our aim is quite clear and quite precise. It's to ensure that um, A and E for our performance nationally during 2015-16 is no worse than it was in 2014-15, and we are going to put some very very clear support mechanisms in place and identify 25, 28 sites um, to ensure that we deliver on our aim. The National Tripartite, so that is the NHS England, TDA and Monitor, produced this aim and it was agreed by the senior responsible officer and executive sponsors on our senior management team for ESIP. This is documented in an overall program initiation document, which I'll refer to later on in, in, the, uh, in the slides, um, when we talk about uh, what a good project needs in terms of documentation. So now we're going to scope. So what is the scope and desired outcomes? A successful pro project defines scope criteria. And what this means really is what is in and what is out of scope for delivering the aim of your project. And that is always done within set time scales and costs. There is always a risk of scope creep. So by this term, we, we mean that in, within those timescales, there generally is uh, always the risk that those deadlines will just creep on a few days, um, and this should always be regularly monitored and mitigated through um, the management of an overall project plan, which would be held centrally in the PMO. The quality of the product to be delivered should be managed throughout the lifetime of the project, and this would be done using evidence-based data, um, which will um, ensure that the quality remains the same and that the aim is delivered at the end of the project. An example of how scope is agreed is in the next slide. But in summary, it captures the criteria that we use to identify the 28 sites in the ECIP program that are in scope. So the slide that you can see now is just um, very, very um, clearly defines the criteria that we use to identify our 28 sites. So these are the, the site systems that we're going to work with that are in scope for our project. And there were two, two uh, clear definitions. There was a year-to-date performance against the A&E 4-hour standard of less than 85% or the year-to-date performance against the A&E 4-hour standard of less than 90% and those that failed last year. So, so the, this data has been analysed by National Tripartite and Department of Health and, um, and then our criteria was set for the 28 sites. There are li likely to be local locality-specific issues, but it's been agreed that it's going to be important to work across all organisations an in initial focus will be on short and medium term solutions up to the end of this year. So I'm going to talk about stakeholders. Um, stakeholders um, within a project is a very important topic. Um, we need to ensure that we engage and communicate well with everybody who is involved in our project. Stakeholder analysis is one of the key steps you should take in any change project. This is going to be to identify everyone with a concern or interest who needs to be involved to help you to deliver your aim. These people who are going to be on our stakeholder list need to be analysed in terms of how you would categorise them. Uh, so the, those people with the greatest involvement 
um, will you will put into a little bit more time and resources will need to be um, put in there to devote to maintaining their involvement and commitment within the project. There will also be more peripheral individuals or groups that still need to be um, on your stakeholder list, but they may have a lesser involvement. The mapping can be presented as a stakeholder grid like the ESIP one on the next slide. So here we have a, a stakeholder map, which is a really good visual tool which has been developed by our communications team. In here on the map you can see all of our stakeholders in the project and they've been categorized in terms of their influence on the success of delivering the emergency care improvement program. These um, stakeholders, as you can see, we've identified some of them that could potentially move from being a, a high influence to um, lesser influence and it's in terms of their desired direction of travel and where they are going to be relevant, relevantly involved in the project. So that's a really good tool to use in terms of project management and it enables everybody to see quite clearly where the stakeholders are and their involvement. So who are the stakeholders and how will, will, will we engage with them? It's been identified that the ECIP program will work with uh, communications teams throughout everybody who's involved, all our different organizations to support them. And we would urge that you engage with your communications teams to put together a pro an appropriate communications and engagement plan. To help with this, our communications work stream has developed a communications pack which will be sent out shortly to all our systems. Within this pack are going to be key messages about the program, a full question and answer session document, information about the patient flow heat map, an understanding of what the program is trying to achieve, and the roles and responsibilities of everybody involved in the project. So now I'm going to talk about structure what's the project structure and the governance structure as well. So what makes a project team? So as we've already uh, referred to, our, our team here at ESIP um, is overseen by our program board or our senior management team. It's led by a senior responsible officer and executive sponsors who will ultimately make decisions and have overall control over the project. The Project Program Management Office, the PMO, is a team including a program manager and project support whose roles and responsibilities are to manage and monitor the project overall, having that really good oversight of the whole program and everybody who's involved in it and being a central point of, of contact for everybody involved in the project. This structure is underpinned by a project initiation document which should include everything that you need, um, all the key information required to start and run a project, including the scope of the project, the objectives, project governance structure, a little bit about the business case goes in there, project controls, the reporting framework that we're working with, the communications plan and the quality management plan. So the PID, as we call it, is it provides a reference point for all of our key stakeholders in the project. It's a very useful document that will, will be held centrally within the PMO. Everybody can refer to when they need to know where, where things are going with the project. So this slide just gives you an overview of our governance structure. So the team, the PMO team and what we're calling the, um, the cluster leads. So we, we clustered all our 28 systems into four clusters that are led by a head of improvement for each one. They feed into our um, director of operations and delivery who then feed up to our senior responsible officer on the senior management team and then ultimately to the national tripartite. There's another stream there that is the um, 
the tripartite stream, so that involves our program director who reports again up to the senior responsible officer and again to the national tripartite. And within that, that section is held the PMO and the communications work stream and the analytics work stream who have teams underneath them that feed up again directly up to the national tripartite. The next slide shows our reporting structure, which is very similar. It just shows the, uh, the, the work streams, the operations and delivery, informatics and communications, who feed up to SMT and then via the national tripartite up to the delivery meeting, which, um, which is our ultimate um, approval mechanism. The clusters all report into the regional tripartites and the SMT. And it's very clearly set out there, and it's a good way to do it in any project to make sure that everybody has this document to refer to. In terms of project documentation, I've already referred to a little bit. A good, successful project always has a project brief, which sets out the aims and objectives. A project mandate, which is a more detailed document containing the terms of reference for the project. Um, as well as identifying prospective executive sponsorship and also details the roles and responsibilities of everybody involved. The business case is, uh, is, um, is where it all begins and the development of the business case would use what, what the aims and objectives are contained in the brief and the mandate. Business case should be maintained throughout the life of the project and it will be a formally approved document that um, is approved by the program, man, uh, program board. In our case, it was a senior management team. And that is the, the basis of our, of our project. Everything refers back to the business case throughout the life of the project. So if we move on to think about time scale or, or time frame, um, the key question here is when does the overall goal or outcome for the project uh, need to be delivered. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, projects are temporary and um, they should have a clear documented time scale, so a start and an end date for delivering the um, agreed objectives. Now depending on those objectives, there may also be a time tolerance where the project could deliver early or late. Um, it would depend entirely on how critical it is to deliver a product at a certain time. Um, it may be disastrous or it might not matter if something's delivered a week or a month later than, than planned. Um, it's also important to note that any, any tolerance in the time would need to be agreed and documented in advance and that would form part of the PID that Cathy was referring to earlier. So having an agreed time scale then enables the project manager with support from the PMO to then start to develop the project plan. So when we're thinking about planning, we're thinking about how are we going to make this happen and how are we going to monitor progress as we go along. So project planning is essentially the, the how, I, how are we going to get there. So once the time scale is agreed, for example, to deliver a product by the end of March, the project manager and the PMO can work together to identify the key stages or phases that would need to be delivered to reach that overall goal or outcome. And each of these stages or steps um, will include a number of actions or deliverables or milestones. So to give a practical example, um, for ESIP we've identified five key phases and they're shown on this next slide. So here we can see the five phases or stages um, and as you can see each of them is underpinned by a series of bullet points which are deliverables, milestones or actions. And the five phases for ESIP are the setup, the diagnostics, the intervention, the monitoring, and finally the evaluation. Now as the phases or stages are often at a very high level, the project manager and PMO can then work together to produce a full and more detailed uh, project plan. And typically this would include all the activities required to get to that stage of delivering the end goal. It could also identify who will lead or do each of that, each activity, and that really helps out with resource planning um, and accountability. Um, it's important to note that the project plan can be, can be produced in all different formats. Um, the format essentially 
doesn't matter. It's the content of the plan that, that's really important. Um, some project managers and PMOs and organizations use specific specialist software. They may use MS Project. Um, others rely on Excel. Um, I've provided an example of a Gantt style plan on the next slide. But essentially, it can be any format you want that enables you to track the progress of your work and to communicate with the rest of the team working and um, what, what's going to be delivered and when. So here we see a Gantt style um, project plan that's been produced in MS Project. And if you look at the left side of the screen, you can see bold text. Um, so it says investigation, analysis, design. So they're the phases or stages that I was just, just talking about. And they correspond on the right hand side um, on the Gantt chart with the black lines. And the length of the lines just depict the, the length of time that it's going to take to deliver that phase. Now, under the bold headings on the left, um, there's some further text. So under investigation, it says research, interview with client. And they're all activities or deliverables um, that form part of, part of those phases. Now, they're depicted on the right hand side as the blue bars. And in this example, you'll also see that there's a named individual that's responsible for delivering all of those tasks. And um, it's the same person in all of these. So somebody is unlucky. And that would actually present a risk and if that person wasn't available to do all of that work. Um, if I just draw your attention to the arrows that you can see at the end of some of the blue bars, they represent interdependencies where an activity can't be started until another one has been delivered successfully. So we now move on to think about risks and, risks and issues. We're thinking about how we, how we manage or mitigate risks and issues. So as a starting point, as a definition, well, a risk is just the possibility of an issue that hasn't happened yet. And if it did end up happening, it could have a negative impact on the project. So risks, if they're not addressed properly and managed, can become issues. And an issue, as I'm sure you're aware, um, is a problem that's relating to the project. And it's actually occurring or just about to occur. And obviously, we'd look to resolve that issue as soon as possible to reduce the detrimental effects on the project. Now, risks and issues should be documented as soon as possible. And as part of that documentation, we should agree mitigating actions and who's going to own and take forward that action to do it. And it would normally be the PMO that holds um, that documentation of all of the risks and issues. So the key thing to remember with risks and issues is that although it might seem laborious, effective risk management reduces issues it's far easier to reduce the impact or chances of something happening than it is to deal with it when it actually happens. Now, carrying on with risks and issues, um, various organizations use all different scoring and documentation mechanisms to manage their risks and issues. Um, but most rely on some simple measures um, for impact or severity and probability or likelihood. Some organizations also add proximity, so how, how soon do we think this could potentially be a problem? And some also add in cost. You know, if this does happen, how significant is the cost burden going to be? So by assessing the impact and the, the probability of a risk occurring, you can, you can actually define the risk and come up with a score. And that's what's shown on, on the bottom right hand side of the screen at the moment. So on the left hand side of the image, we've got severity. And as you can see, that goes from something that's negligible, which would just score a one, to something that's catastrophic, which would score a five. So you'd, you'd decide where your risk fits in terms of its severity if it, if it did happen. You'd also, which is the section at the bottom, look at how likely it is that it might happen with a one being improbable and a five being frequent. So if we think about an example, if you've got a risk that you decided had low severity, which scored a two, and there was a remote likelihood of it happening, you know, that would be an overall score of a four, which would just be something that you needed to monitor. It would be low, it would be green. On the other end of the spectrum, if you have something which you think would be catastrophic if it happened, and, it, and it's highly likely it's going to happen, that, that would score 25. So you'd have a red risk, and you would really need to stop and take action then to, to reduce the impact if that did happen. Now, the PMO would usually support all of this process, and they'd hold the master copy of the risk log. 
and they would ensure both that initial scoring happens and mitigating actions and owners are agreed, and also that there's regular review and risks and issues are rescored and um, closed if applicable. Right, so now we're going to talk about reporting. This is really important in the project. How will we report progress? So a good reporting structure should be in place using an overall project plan which maintains momentum of the project um, and it's monitored and reported on regularly by the program by the uh, program management office. So a good reporting uh, structure would be developed in your project and you would decide with your work streams how that reporting pro process is going to work. Examples of reporting are by using highlight reports or progress reports, which would contain the progress that's been made this week, actions that you're going to be doing for the next week, anything, any key areas that you want to highlight to the any key meetings that are going to be taking place, etc. So that's a good overview of one particular area of the project that you want to report on. Other ways of doing it are just by reporting by exception only. So this cuts down on the workload quite considerably. Um, it just literally would tell you any problems, anything that you need to highlight for your particular project area um, that, that, will, that, that need to be escalated. And those can those be done on a weekly basis, fortnightly basis. You would uh, design that around your project and about, around your project plan. Weekly meetings could also take place, face-to-face -face meetings, there's always some, you know, something really good about having a face-to-face -face meeting where individual work streams can come along and report on their progress and highlight any risks. We do this here at the ESIP team, we meet weekly and the work streams um, report into our senior management team, so those are the informatics work stream, communications, delivery and the tripartite work stream. So we built that into our governance structure that we want to have a face-to-face -face meeting if possible every week and they come along to the meeting and they provide us with a, a, a documented update report as well as talking us through that report and having discussions where necessary. So learning from, from all this documentation and all the work that's going on within the project, we need to capture lessons learned along the way. So this, this can start right at the beginning of the project, just a very, very simple way of capturing this information. It doesn't have to be a, a really fancy document. It's just a way that everybody can capture events or anything that's happened as they're going along with the project that may cause an impact and what that impact is and how it's been learned from mitigated in some cases. Um, and you can, it's a really useful document that would be used right throughout the lifetime of the project and reviewed at the end of it. And you could get some really, really good um, information that you can then take on to other projects in the future. All the key stakeholders would be involved in this. We would encourage everybody to capture anything that's happening in their parts of the project. And that would be stored centrally as well in the PMO. So now, now we've talked about PMO quite a lot, we're going to try and define what makes what is a PMO. So as you can see with the little logo at the top, the Program Management Office is, is sort of the, the key and the centre of project, project management in an organisation, right from project initiation through to project delivery. So a program management office defines and maintains standards for program management within an organisation. A PMO maintains an oversight of a number of projects, so it's not, it's not something that is actually doing the do, it, that, that's the project management team that are out there and doing the actual work. The PMO is an oversight of all the projects that are going on in their organisation. It's also a source of documentation guidance and metrics. So it's a central point for everybody to go to. 
A PMO underpins a basis of project management and has a coordinating role ensuring adherence to agreed processes and facilitates good governance and reporting procedures. So what makes a great PMO? Well, hopefully, we think that you should be able to know now what makes a great PMO after we've talked about it to you now on this webinar. So we think it, it, a really good PMO has got good governance, good communication and engagement, and good overall control underpinned by good project management. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much to Cathy and to Gavin for their presentation there. Um, I'm sure we'll all agree that was, that was a really helpful overview. Thank you ever so much. Um, if anybody has any questions at all, um, please feel free to email them through to the ESIP mailbox at esipinfo at nhselect.org.uk or to the email address that's on your screen at the moment, nhs.esip at nhs.net. And all questions will be forwarded to Cathy and Gav for response. So thank you once again, and we look forward to you joining us for the next webinar um, in the ESIP series. Thank you.